let's get right to the point. Let me introduce to you Mr. Richard Maybury. Good evening, Richard. Hi, Harry. How you doing? What a pleasure to have you on the show. And there are Thank you. so many things I want to ask you to talk about because of the various things that you covered in this latest issue, one of them being the background of the British Empire, which is really fascinating, and how it affects the wars on terrorism today or the terrorist wars today and how it affects the United States. But let's begin by, if you would, just giving us a brief description of what you call chaos, then, because that seems to underlie just about everything else that you talk about. Okay. Um, very briefly. <laughs> uh, the, Five words or less. Right, right. Uh, uh, after the American Revolution, um, uh, people uh, around the world were you know, watching America, and they saw this amazing uh, outbreak of liberty and prosperity, and they wanted it for themselves. And so the, the principles that underlie the American Revolution began to spread around the world. And um, that's the meaning of the Statue of Liberty. The, the, the real name of the statue is Liberty Enlightening the World, and the statue faces outward from New York toward the rest of the world. Well, the principles began to spread around the world, but um, along the middle of the 1800s, the Socialist Revolution uh, began, and um, that kind of choked off this spread of the American principles. And the, uh, the main area, or I should say perhaps the most important area, that never got those principles was what I call chaos stand, and that's the area which is East Europe, Asia, and North Africa today. Um, that area uh, never got these fundamental legal principles at all, um, and so it remains um, politically and legally in roughly the same condition that it's been for thousands of years, and that is that um, there is no um, uh, underlying ethical principles in most of the law, and when we look at a map and we see uh, what looks to us like countries, because there are borders there and all, that's really very, very misleading. There are no real countries over there. It's all just uh, clans and tribes, and uh, essentially each village is a separate country. Um, and, and, and whoever rules in any given geographical area does it with an iron hand with no respect for a traditional set of laws or anything else. It's just whoever has the power, right? That's right. It's very arbitrary, um, uh, kind of a king of the mountain situation. Whoever's uh, got the most power runs things. Uh, without regard to any sorts of uh, ethical principles. And, and again, that's the area from uh, basically from Morocco to Indonesia is, is that area. And um, I call it chaos, Dan, because under this situation where there is no, no rational legal system in any of these countries, all you can have is chaos. And, and that's essentially what they have. Um, it's just a, this great big sea of, of uh, quarrels and, and wars and revolutions. It goes on constantly. Um, the last time I, I counted, there were better than 40 wars going on over there. And uh, that's what I call chaos, Dan, East Europe, Asia, and Africa. Okay, and how does that affect us? Well, uh, it would not affect us a whole lot if the U.S. government wouldn't um, be involved over there. They have been meddling over there for decades and decades and um, making enemies. Um, so the, you know, if, if the U.S. maintained a policy of neutrality and had no political connections, then I think that our situation would be you know, vastly better than it is. But because we are embroiled over there, there's all these crazy alliances with people like the Saudis and the Kuwaitis. Um, you know, the United States has just been drawn into those quarrels, uh, those Hatfields and McCoys situations over there. And that's the fundamental reason why 9-11 happened, is, is the U.S. Uh, government got us entangled in this chaotic part of the world. What you are saying, of course, is that the leaders of our country very rarely take into consideration any of these things you're talking about, not just the lack of legal principles in these countries, but the lack of tradition for any kind of legal principles, and they take no concern whatsoever about the history of these countries and how these countries grew to hate the Westerners, like the British Empire that conquered Iraq and, I and Iran, for instance, and these others, and uh, as a result, they're just, uh, our leaders are just continuing to do the same things that have created all these resentments in these countries. Right. I, I would like to, to emphasize very quickly that I'm not criticizing the, the individual people who live over there. I'm criticizing those governments in that part of the world. And there's, you know, the people are not the government. And the, the governments, they're just a bunch of rattlesnakes. Um, from, like I said, from Morocco to Indonesia, it's just a bunch of rattlesnakes. And the U.S. government pokes sharp sticks at some of these rattlesnakes, and it forms alliances with other rattlesnakes. And so we get a lot of snake bites. There's, there's nothing, <laughs> I mean, what a mess. <laughs> right. I mean, it is just so awful. But again, I'm not criticizing the billions of people who live over there. They're no happier about it than we are. It's the government. So, for instance, the, the 22 or 23 governments in the Arab League, every one of them is a dictatorship. And the U.S. government has formed alliances with some of those dictators. Of course, we've discussed in this show from time to time some of these things, like the British rule over Iraq and the American upsetting the government in Iran in 1951, all of which create resentments. And as you've pointed out, both in your books and in your newsletter, these resentments are taught. 
in schools and, and are passed down from generation to generation so that while Americans are oblivious to what went on to, in Iran in 1951, Iranians are not. And Iranians remembered it in 1979 when they took over the U.S. Embassy, the, the U.S. Embassy being the center of that coup in 51, and the result being that the Shah then ruled for 28 years with an iron hand. And people remember that 50 years ago, but they remember it. Americans don't know it at all, so they think all this stuff comes from out of the blue. That's right. One of the um, uh, examples that I use of, on this a lot is that uh, the U.S. Um, Constitution was written about 200 years ago, so the country we call America is about 200 years old, and that's about the limit of the American view on, on history. We think that 200 years ago was a long time ago. Uh, Egypt's civilization goes back 6,000 years, and um, the civilization that's in Israel goes back something like nine or 10,000 years. So for what we consider to be something that happened a long time ago, and it's a bygone, in terms of those people's way of thinking, you know, something that happened 200 years ago is just yesterday. Right. You uh, mentioned earlier about the village versus uh, the villages being more the uh, nations there rather than what we think of as these countries, that each village is different from the others. What are some of the implications of that that you see? Well, um, one is that the reason you see the borders in that part of the world that you see when you look at a map, and, and the reason we're all misled by those borders, is those borders were not drawn by the people who live there. They were drawn by the Europeans, because the Europeans conquered almost the entire world. Uh, there were very, very few places that they did not conquer, and then they drew the borders uh, in the places that were convenient to them. And so in a lot of cases, they, they would draw a border right through the middle of, of the traditional homeland of any given clan or tribe, so you have some people living on one side of the border and some on the other um, in separate so-called countries that are actually part of what they regard as a real country themselves, their clan is a country. That's part of it. And so um, there are the, you'll have people that are more loyal to the people on the other side of the border than they are to the people who claim to be the government. Uh, you can imagine the uh, political implications of that. They form alliances with, with their clan members on the other side of the border against their own government a lot of times. Which also may be part of the reason that people are coming in from Iran and Syria to Iraq right now to try to fight against the Americans because they feel a kinship with some of the people in Iraq, but not all of them, as you're pointing out. Yes, that's exactly right. Um, another implication is that the U.S. government goes into these countries and forms alliances with these artificial governments that claim to control the area, when in fact these artificial governments uh, command almost no loyalty from their own people. And, so, and you know, these artificial governments are essentially just a clan that the Europeans picked out to run the place a long time ago. So all the other clans in the country are enemies of this ruling clan, and the U.S. government has therefore formed an alliance with this, this bunch of cutthroats that claim to run the place, and, and we just automatically make enemies with all the other clans in the country by doing that. And, you know, they, they hate us <laughs> just because we're sending money and weapons and ammunition and all to this clan that's trying to keep them down. Um, I've pointed out in, in early warning report many, many times that um, if you have to point to one thing that caused this war or that causes the U.S. government to be hated almost everywhere, it's foreign aid, because that foreign aid goes to these ruling regimes in these countries over there that are hated by millions and millions of their own people. Yeah, that's a good point. And also, right along with that, because these countries are made up of diverse people, then the regime has to be brutal in order to keep everybody in line because they don't have the support of maybe even the majority of the people. Uh, in Iraq, for instance, the, uh, Hussein was the first person who was able to bring control over the Kurds, the Sunnis, and the Shiites all at the same time, and he could do it only through brutality. So by definition, any aid that the, our government gives to them is giving aid to brutality, and it's going to exist that way in all of those Middle Eastern countries, at least, as well as in many of the countries of Africa and even some of those in East Asia. Let's go to the phones now and talk with Eric who's in New Orleans. Eric, are you with us? Hi, good evening. Good evening. You have a question for Richard? Uh, well, sure. Actually, um, I'm a fellow libertarian as well. Um, there's one thing I guess that I differ from you, and I, you know, I do believe that we have gotten ourselves involved in uh, what we're referred to as foreign entanglements by the, by the framers of our uh, great nation. Mm -hmm. And uh, But the thing is, is, just as a perfect example, in the past week we had the announcement of these uh, basically espionages that were taking place at Guantanamo Bay, and some of them may have been agents for Syria. And now, granted, I don't agree with foreign entanglements in, in the sense that we you know, dispense aid to, you know, to such brutal people, but, you know, they're over here and they're trying to do whatever they can to sabotage us in our way of life and, and I think that it's you know it's only fair and uh, I guess the most intelligent move would be to infiltrate them and to, to you know do whatever we can to fight them from the inside out. Uh, now what I understand Eric to be saying is that there are a lot of ruthless people that are over here now uh, trying to hurt us and uh, he won't get any argument from me. Um, what I would point out is that any longtime reader of Early Warning Report knows that I've been warning people for many, many years, since 1991, that if the U.S. government did not stop meddling in the Middle East and the other places over there, that the people were going to get mad and they were going to come over here after us. 
Now, that, that warning goes back well over 10 years, and it was repeated over and over again for that whole time. So there's nothing surprising here to me. The question is, why are they over here? Um, the, you know, it, it comes down to, well, when did this thing really start? Now, one uh, point in time that you can track it back to if you want, you might remember uh, Robert Kennedy being killed by Sirhan Sirhan. Well, that's a good place if, if you want to mark a point where this war started, because what was going on is Robert Kennedy was running for president, and he made a promise that if he was elected, he would give 50 F-4 Phantom jets to the Israeli government. And that was in 1968. Uh, right. And Sirhan Sirhan was a Palestinian, so he killed Robert Kennedy. Now, that was a warning. Right there, the United States should have awakened and said, uh-oh, you know, maybe we aren't doing the right thing over there. Um, but nobody did. It was totally ignored. Americans still uh, refused to understand uh, what was going on in that part of the world. And so the U.S. government's meddling in that part of the world continued, and the so-called terrorism continued to escalate decade after decade. And here we are now. Yes, and, and if we continue to go over there and infiltrate them or fight them or whatever it is, then obviously they're going to continue to come over here. So that isn't going to do anything about it. Uh, it's very easy for people to say, well, you've got to use force because that's the only thing they understand. Well, the fact is that force doesn't seem to work. It doesn't seem to work in the Israel-Palestine disagreements. It doesn't seem to work anywhere else in the world because all you do is just start the next war to get even with uh, whoever had the most force in the first war. And so the only possible way out of this morass is for the United States to withdraw from around the world. And you can do it, as they said Nixon ought to do in Vietnam, and that is withdraw and declare victory, or you can withdraw and declare defeat, or you can withdraw and apologize, or you can withdraw any way you want to, but unless you withdraw, they're going to continue coming over here and creating problems. And there isn't any kind of military action that's going to stop lone terrorists from coming over here and doing whatever they can. And I'm sorry to monopolize that. Eric, anything further well, to say? Sure, absolutely. I would Actually, I would put World War II and the Cold War as two perfect examples in which absolute might plus diplomatic meddling led to the collapse and destruction of tyranny and terrorists against free people. I mean, we did it to, to, the, to, the, to the Nazis, and we also did it to the Japanese. And, and through meddling and through absolute strength and force, we did put an end to their terrorists on their local area plus on us. I mean, Pearl Harbor happened and then that was it. It was able to repel. Oh, good heavens. Um, but, is that at your end, Eric? Yes, sir. I'm sorry. Okay. Well, as long as it's somebody dying in your living room. It, no, it's well, yeah, it was out here on the street. Uh, an accident apparently just took place. But, um, but I, I understand what you're saying, Eric. And uh, Richard, I'm monopolizing everything here. So is there anything you'd like to say to address that? Well, yeah, sure. Um, I point out two things. The first is that, yes, the U.S. can um, win this war militarily if we're willing to win it the way we did in World War II. And that means go over there and massacre those people by the millions. Not just the ones who are guilty, but everybody else, too. Yes, we can win that way. Are we willing to go out and massacre millions of innocent people? Now, another thing I would like to point out is that um, a good example, again, of what's really going on here is if you look at the Persian Gulf, um, Persia is Iran. And the reason that the Persian Gulf is called the Persian Gulf is that it belonged to Iran for more than 2,000 years. Now, if you look in the Persian Gulf, you'll see that there's been dozens of U.S. warships in there for a long time. Well, if you look in Chesapeake Bay, you won't find any Iranian warships, and there haven't been any in there. Well, another thing that we might add, too, is that, first of all, the United States did not win the Cold War with force. They did not defeat mm. Soviet troops anywhere in the world. In fact, they fought to a standstill in Korea, and they lost in Vietnam, and, of course, on both sides. Tens of thousands of people died. And secondly, the Second World War created the Cold War by giving Eastern Europe to the Soviets and creating a war mentality that Truman played upon in 1948 with the war scare in order to get America to go along with a much bigger federal budget. And I just don't see where we can consider World War II a victory for anything. The United States didn't have to even be in it in the first place. So it's an interesting uh, concept to think, well, that's an example. But you have to remember also that when Osama bin Laden made his statement, uh, I think it was sometime after September 11th, uh, they released a tape, and the three things that he mentioned as examples of U.S. terrorism were occupying Mecca, support for Israel, and the atomic bomb in Japan. A lot of people remember how we won that war and consider America to be the first terrorist. But, of course, their memory doesn't go back uh, far enough either. But the point is that the United States did not come out of that war clean, and we certainly haven't come out of the Cold War clean. In my book, The War Racket, I'm titling the chapter on the Cold War, The Cold War Prelude to Terrorism, because we laid the groundwork all over the world during the Cold War for the reactions as we have seen in Iran and Iraq and all of these other places by supporting the wrong people simply if they said they were anti-communist. Eric, give us a last word before we move on. Well, as I said, uh, you know, di diplomacy and meddling has worked to our benefit even if for only a short time, and, and, and I guess as Reagan said, peace through strength. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for calling, Eric. Uh, join us any time. Let's go now to Jeffrey in New Orleans. Yes, uh, first of all, I tuned in just a few minutes ago to hear your thesis concerning these governments around the world. You do not take into account the fact that many of these governments in the Middle East, which are enemies of their own people, are enemies because they are socialist and are part of an international communist conspiracy 
that is out to bring about a world government. Let me give you several examples of this. In Algeria, the government has massacred over 100,000 or more people simply because the people of Algeria wanted to vote themselves into an, a religiously oriented government under an Islamic law. In the case of Israel and Palestine, Yasser Arafat is an avowed communist and an ally of Fidel Castro, Mao Zedong, um, Hu Jintao, Red China, etc. Okay, and Jeffrey, you've given us enough examples to make your point. Answer a question for us. Why, then, is the United States giving money and support and military equipment to these, what you call, communist governments? Because our own government is aiding and abetting the spread of communism to bring about a world government in league with this international communist conspiracy, which is controlling our own government. Look at the Patriot Anti-Terrorism Act, Airport Security Act, Homeland Security Act, and look at Bush's attitude towards support in the U.N., as long as the U.N. Um, works for, for world order, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Richard, comment? Yes. Well, I, I can certainly say that um, if I were uh, trying to set up a tyrannical world government, I would be absolutely thrilled with the behavior of the U.S. government here lately uh, with the Patriot Act and, and so forth. So, yeah, I would sure, certainly agree with that. The only thing we need to notice, though, however, is that these things are not new. We had the same kind of things in World War One. We had the same kind of things in World War Two. So you don't necessarily have to attribute them to any particular conspiracy. During wartime, government will use every power at its disposal to gain more control of our lives. Jeffrey, thanks for calling. Let me give you a couple of quick email questions, Richard, before mm -hmm. we go back to the phone. Okay. Joe in Colorado Springs says, I believe Mr. Mayberry deplores war and advises his clients on how to not become a victim of its economic effects, which is correct. That's what you do in your newsletter. Doesn't following his advice, however, entail investing in and therefore co-owning those companies that profit from the war? Isn't this hypocritical, albeit profitable? And, of course, what he's referring to that our listeners may not realize is that you very often recommend defense, or I don't like to call them defense, military companies like Halliburton and others that you think are going to be profiting from this or ones that produce particular kinds of weapons that the United States is going to need a lot of if they're going to continue fighting the war on terrorism. Right, and uh, I hear this complaint a lot, and, and I can certainly see that intuitively it seems you know, abhorrent to invest in, in weapons companies because there's kind of this intuitive assumption that if you're earning a profit from the war, then you're helping to make the war worse. I would point out that when you live in a, an economy that's so heavily controlled by the government, a lot of things that appear to be so aren't so. Um, a lot of uh, investments that appear to be squeaky clean are actually very corrupt, and a lot of them that look corrupt aren't anywhere near as corrupt as the ones that look squeaky clean. Um, an example I would give is that, um, let's say, 1998, you've uh, got some money in the bank or you've got treasury bills or treasury bonds. Um, I'm sure everybody uh, listening to us uh, falls in that category, and I do too. Banks always loan some of their money to the government. So we're all in the business of loaning money to the government directly. It's almost inescapable if you're part of this economy. Well, in 1998, if you had your money in a bank or in treasury bills, treasury bonds, you were loaning money directly to Bill Clinton, who used part of it to fire his so-called MICA missiles into Afghanistan and Sudan and Iraq, which um, was a diversion from his, uh, his uh, sex scandals and killed some, we don't know how many innocent people it killed, but um, it did convince millions of Muslims who were fence-sitters that America really is as corrupt as the radicals were saying, uh, because Americans didn't do anything about that. Um, Clinton did it. And, and, uh, and we didn't do anything. So um, if you were in a bank or a treasury bills, treasury bonds in 1998, you were directly helping the government fire those missiles, which was one of the provocations for this war. Now, compare that to owning stock in, let's say, General Dynamics. Nobody has yet shown me how um, owning stock in General Dynamics makes the war worse. Um, I have, you know, I own some of that stock. I have absolutely nothing to say about what the government does um, in its relations with other countries. Nobody ever calls me up and says, what should we do? Um, it's just, I know it's intuitively true. It seems to be that if you're earning profits, you're making it worse. But, but show me the evidence of that. The way I look at it is that this is very much like if we predict a, a hurricane. If we think there's going to be a hurricane, we invest in uh, plywood companies. And if the hurricane hits, then we're making money selling plywood. We're making big profits off the hurricane. We didn't cause the hurricane, but we're making big profits off of it. And this is basically the same thing. Wars cause flows of money to change. They go, the flows of money go from peaceful pursuits toward um, uh, more military-type things. And, and you've got a choice. You're going to be where the money is going from, or you're going to be where the money is going to. Let's go now to Les in Arizona. Good evening, Les. Good evening. I don't want to get anybody in trouble here, but I may say something that is pretty politically incorrect. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, never, we never do that on this show. <laughs> you know, I, I keep going. Yeah, not, not you, Harry, that's for sure. But I keep going back to the, the basic algebra. A plus B equals C. And if you know any two of those three, you can figure out the third one. Now, you... In order to solve the problem, first you have to identify it and recognize it, and then you can start coming to a solution. Well, some people have the ability to, to do that, but they refuse to identify it. So you have a group of people that can't and a group of people that won't. The point being is that if, 
we're so controlled in this country, our, our mind is so controlled in this country, that if we say that we think there's injustices going on against a group of people in the world, i.e. the Palestinians by another group of people that we're funding, we are automatically branded anti-Semitic. And we have 70 million people in this country whose minds are sort of controlled by the, the ministers that believe that the formation of the state of Israel is a fulfillment of biblical prophecy. And that is a prevailing attitude among a large segment of the people, which are actually voters. And so that's what I view as kind of the part of the problem that's over there, that we cannot honestly have a discourse, a discussion, on this issue in this country without being attacked if we're not on one side. Well, even if you're not attacked as anti-Semitic, you are attacked as thinking that there is something sacred right. about Israel, that we absolutely cannot abandon Israel. It's like saying that if England got into trouble, we'd have to rush and defend it. And, of course, Israel's always in trouble because of the way it was created in the first place. Rick, comments? Uh, I don't think uh, the gentleman said anything that I would disagree with. Um, <laughs> he's sure right. It's politically incorrect to point that out, but I, I would agree with everything he said. Yeah, so we can't have... We, the, the, the thing is, is we cannot have in this country an honest discussion if you're on one side or the other. Mm -hmm, right. And I, I just wanted to comment on that. Well, there there are a lot of people who are criticizing the support for Israel, and they're able to do it without being branded anti-Jewish or anything of the sort. I mean, I'm talking not just about libertarians, but a lot of liberals are on the Palestinian side. But, of course, here again, they have to take one side or the other. And liber the libertarian attitude is we shouldn't be on either side. It's none of our business. The only thing we all have in common is that we pay for it. Well, that's not true. <laughs> and, Harry, I'll see, you in, I'll see you in Phoenix here in the next month or so. I'm looking forward to okay, it. Okay, thanks for the time. You bet. Uh, Harry, can I interrupt you a minute? Yeah, by all means. Um, I, we were on the subject of investing a minute ago, and I would just like to, to say before we, we drift further away from that that um, I'd like to point out to the audience that what kind of brought you and I uh, closer together in the last couple of years is my belief that your fail-safe investing plan is really the one that makes the most sense for the new world that we entered after 9-11. And um, I have uh, endorsed that book and recommended it to all of my subscribers. And uh, I would like to just emphasize, I have never seen any other investment plan that I think gives a better chance of keeping what you have than uh, the fail-safe investing plan. Well, I appreciate that very much. And I will only add to it that the plan works whether you've got a 1000 or $2,000 in the bank or you've got $3 million that you have in a very extensive portfolio. And, of course, people know how to get that book. We have two ads an hour on this show. We're going to break now for the news, but when we come back, we'll talk a little further with Richard Maybury, and we can talk with you if you'd like to call 1-800-510-TALK. This is Harry Brown. Before we go back to the phones, I just want to mention that I haven't said anything tonight about Richard's books, which uh, longtime listeners of this show know I have mentioned a number of times on the broadcast. The three most relevant books right now are The Thousand-Year War, which details the history of the Middle East and how we have gotten to this point, and Richard touched on just a tiny sliver of it earlier in the show, but it's a fascinating book and does help to explain greatly the war on terrorism. And the other two that I particularly like to mention are the books on World War I and, the, and World War II, both of which are very, very well done. And I have to mention a fourth, and that is Whatever Happened to Justice, which is the best book I have ever read on the subject of the rule of law and how simple the law is when it's the right law, that you don't need thousands and thousands of laws or regulations. All you need to do is to respect two things, and that is do all that you have agreed to do and do not in interfere with anyone's person or property without his permission. And if those laws are obeyed, then everything else falls into place, and you don't have to worry about it. And Richard did a spectacular job in that book, Whatever Happened to Justice, of explaining this, how this common law developed and how it has been lost. And it's uh, all of his books are written in a way that are good for adults and also for teenagers. So if you have a child that you want to try to have understand some of these concepts, those that are relevant to the, to the child and his development, then I highly recommend his books. And all of those books are available at his website, richardmaybury.com, Maybury being M-A-Y-B-U-R-Y. So enough of the commercial. Uh, Richard, let's go back to the phones and talk with Dan in San Diego. Okay. Dan, it's good to hear from you again. How are you this evening? I'm okay, Harry, and how are you? And uh, Richard, right? Yes. yes. <laughs> you know, it's, it's so interesting. I, I listen and I hear people talking about justification for some of the things that are being done by our government. Uh, to make up for the fact that, for instance, it was funny, to make up for the fact that our government has alliances and to give money and aid to people that seem to hate us, we have to do things about that than if we just didn't do it in the first place. So people are really looking, though. They don't understand that there are some answers, and by decreasing government, we can fight terrorism. And everything that the, uh, the power structure we have today, no matter what the problem, they have to spend more of your money or control more of whatever you do. But if we lay out, let's say, four exact points, for instance, to reduce government and fight terrorism, to save money to fight terrorism, to not have a new tax, okay, allow self-defense, such as on 911. If there had been allowed a uh, free market in airline security, people might not have had to worry because box cutters against armed security on planes. And that doesn't cost anything. Get the government out of the airline uh, security where they were uh, preventing all that. Number two, why allow the Middle East to have so much money from oil when we can uh, free up our market here so people can responsibly drill for oil? 
So now we've taken money out of the Middle East. Instead of financing it or enriching it, we're now uh, taking money out of the Middle East by reducing government here. Uh, third point would be end the war on drugs. Because the government spends a lot of money telling us that the, the war on drugs finances terrorists. So we can save money, we can deal with drugs honestly, we can get our drugs the boring way we get alcohol, and we can defund terrorism all over the world. Uh, and last but not least on the short list is get the troops out of the foreign countries because while we've already enabled and enriched, this is what enrages them. <laughs> and what we need to do is stop is to disable, let people protect themselves. We need to uh, defund, which is to end the war on drugs and allow oil production here, and we need to deflate. To disable, defund, deflate. And no, these are by, by removing our troops from all over the world so they have no reason to call us the great uh, evil. The great Satan. Uh, Dan, that's very good. I know Richard will want to argue with every one of those points, right, Richard? <laughs> <laughs> I would, no, I would add, add to, one, to them. I'd add a fifth one. Um, you'll never find a more uh, enthusiastic fan of the Founding Fathers than me, but they were human and they made mistakes. And in my opinion, one of the mistakes they made was that the Bill of Rights stops at the border. Inside the U.S., the, the federal government's uh, power has been limited to some extent, um, but outside the U.S., the federal government can do anything at once. And because the Bill of Rights stops at the border, that's why you've got the federal government supporting all these cutthroat regimes all over the world. Um, if the federal government were giving money and, and ammunition and heavy weapons to some group of gangsters inside the United States, uh, the president would certainly be removed from office and maybe thrown in prison. But they do that outside the country all the time, and, and nobody says, you know, nobody complains. Well, may I just point out that it's because in politics today, extremes are all that are allowed. People would say, oh, well, we're not going to be pacifists. Okay, fine. So what do they do? They spread troops out all over the world. <laughs> they could be in the middle, the moderate libertarian stand, which is to have troops to defend this country. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. I, I would uh, make one point, and that is that I don't believe that they were deficient with regard to the Bill of Rights. It's just that they perhaps did not emphasize it strongly enough. The Bill of Rights mm -hmm. is, is simply limitations on government, and it does not say whether free speech applies to citizens or non-citizens. It says free speech applies to government, meaning Congress shall make no law, and Congress shall not uh, take uh, search and seize and do all these other things. The government shall not search and seize. It doesn't say this applies only to citizens, but as you're pointing out, Richard, it mm -hmm. was not emphasized enough that this applies to everybody, and we have discussed this on the show, but not for a long time, the importance of having it apply to everybody, and the fact that ter if you don't give terrorists and foreigners the protections of the Bill of Rights, then you are likely to go around convicting a whole bunch of innocent people because they have the power to do so, and the result of that will be that the guilty continue to go free. So the Bill of Rights is as much a protection of the third parties in this country as it is the person who's been accused. Dan, thanks so much for calling. You always have something interesting to say. And let's go now to Idaho and talk with Ben. Good evening, Ben. Uh, good evening, Harry. Nice to uh, hear from you. I'm sorry. I said nice to hear from you. I'm glad to be talking again. Uh, one of the things I find strange about in our whole Middle East policy or lack of policy is uh, is uh, no one hardly mentions the Kurds, uh, uh, the Kurdish uh, people. Uh, the only group in Iraq that really wanted us there, uh, and uh, they, you know, uh, the, the, the Kurdish people are the uh, the largest what ethnic group. By ethnic meaning speaks a separate language uh, that doesn't have a government. Uh, after World War One, when the League of Nations carved up the Ottoman Empire, Turkey, uh, according to Winston Churchill III, uh, his grandfather uh, wanted a, a separate Kurdistan to be created, and it was not. And they gave put about half the Kurds in Turkey, left them in Turkey, a mistake. And uh, now, you know, despite the fact that they're probably the only viable ethnic group over there that could uh, function in some sort of semi-quasi-democracy, they're totally ignored. You know, the last thing we'll do is uh, uh, allow uh, the Kurds to become independent. Uh, and they are a viable ethnic group, and, you know, no one talks about them now. You know, the only place we can travel in, in uh, Iraq are areas that are over 90% Kurdish. You know, they feed our soldiers, and they, uh, they're they armed, and they protect our soldiers. And, uh, uh, they're the, you know, the only group over there that, you know, has some... Uh, thought or, or understanding of uh, self-governance. Sure, that's I, I just find that strange. Like the Palestinians, you know, we, we give lip service, but uh, you know, Yasser Arafat was born in Egypt. Cairo was there until he was thirty and speaks an Egyptian dialect of Arabic. In fact, there is no Palestinian Arabic dialect. They speak Syrian dialect or they're whatever Arabs happened to go into Palestine in the past 100 years. But the Kurds are a viable ethnic group, an Indo-European language, and it could possibly a democracy, something like that could work because uh, uh, they're Sufi. Uh, Muslims, which is kind of like Unitarian Christians, <laughs> yeah. barely Muslims, and there's a lot of Christians and a lot of uh, traditional non-Christians, non-Muslim uh, uh, Kurds too. Right, Ben, you, you, make, you, you make a good point, Richard. Do you want to comment on that? Yeah, I would. I would agree with everything. Except, I, I don't think I would jump to the conclusion that they like us. Um, they consider Washington to be uh, not so much of an evil as Saddam Hussein. But I point out that um, Washington is allied with the Turks, who are the Kurds' enemies. And in 1991, uh, Bush Sr. sold the Kurds out. He encouraged them to rise up against Saddam, and they were one of the groups who did. And then he just backed off and let them be uh, overrun. So um, I think that uh, you know they do want us in there as a protection, but uh, 
once they feel really safe, they're going to want us to go away. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see what happens. I figure within six months they're just going to declare independence, mm-hmm. and then the Turks are going to get all hysterical. And, and the United States will probably uh, do everything they can to stop that independence. Yeah. Rumsfeld already made it plain that he does not want to see any separate nations carved out of Iraq. <laughs> uh, obviously, that would be too sane. Thanks so much for calling, Ben. Always glad to hear from you. Oh, yes, enjoy it. Richard, thank you so much for being with us this evening. When, we come, when we come back from the break, I'll give the phone number and the website again for Richard's newsletter and his introductory package. But let me just say that I've really appreciated your being here the past hour. I think you, as always, provide very provocative insights and things that we don't hear from other people. And that's what we want to have on this show. Well, thanks a lot, Harry. I enjoyed it, and uh, it's good working with you. Okay. Thanks again, Richard. All right. Let's go back to the telephones and talk with Mark in New Orleans. Good evening, Mark. Yes, uh, good evening, Harry. Good to hear from you. Thank you very much. I wanted to uh, make a few comments about uh, some comments that your previous caller, Eric, mentioned. And he mentioned about, uh, you know, now that uh, Bush got us into whatever mess, now we, we have to go along with it. You know, that I, I think that's a silly idea, but uh, let's examine it. It's a very popular one also. That yeah, well, maybe we shouldn't have done it, but now we're there. We have no choice. Yeah, well, the stupidity runs in mobs. You know, and, <laughs> you know it's just like paddle. You know, the, you know, they're not the most intelligent beings in the world. Uh, but uh, let's think about it. This espionage, the enemy. I don't know that Syria is the enemy. Have you? When has Syria done anything to us? What has Syria? What is Syria doing that, that they would be considered the enemy? As he said. Well, they refuse to speak in English, for one thing. Well, I guess so. Uh, and they're uh, doing that intentionally to dishonor us. Uh, but, but, then, besi- but beside that, Mark, I have to agree with you. I can't think of anything that they've done to us. Then, uh, because supposedly they charged uh, two people for espionage, or, or maybe one is not even charged. And the other one, uh, I, I'm not too sure what the charges are going to be, if there are going to be any, but uh, about uh, this uh, detention camp, uh, this concentration camp that, they, uh, that the Bush has in, uh, in, in Cuba, which is totally unconstitutional, and it's a disgrace. It is uh, just the kidnapping people that they just rounded up, you know, for no reason. You know, we had no reason to be in, in Afghanistan. Afghanistan was not the enemy. I, I don't know if anything that they did to us, uh, but the Bush decided to go in there, and they just rounded up a lot of people. They're in Cuba, no charges against them, uh, uh, and, and just treat it uh, you know, pretty much like animals. Uh, it's, it's interesting that you mention that about the no charges against them. The Bill of Rights says specifically that everybody is entitled to a speedy trial, and it does not say anything in there about wartime or peacetime. But you hear people continually saying, well, these are prisoners of war. They're not normal people. Well, there is no war. There is no declared war with Afghanistan. There's no declared war with Syria. There's not even a declared war with Iraq. You can't possibly say that they're prisoners of war, but even if they are, there is but nothing... Even if, even if they are prisoners of war, uh, Bush is totally disregarding the Geneva Convention. Yes. And, uh, you know, and he's, uh, you know, he's, uh, uh, he's criminal in that, particular, uh, in that particular way. He's totally disregarding the, you know, the, uh, the uh, Geneva Convention, and the United States is a, you know, is a signatory country to it. And, uh, and, and I don't know of any information that uh, these people could have sent to Syria that, that Syria could use to damage us. You yes. know, like the stating, I think they said something about that they were sending messages uh, that uh, detailed, uh, you know, where the camp is located and the you know, particular uh, details of the structure. <laughs> yeah, so how is that going to damage us? Even if, if the Syrians, the uh, Syrian officials were to know that, how, how could they possibly use this against us in any way that uh, we, we would have to suffer for it? Totally idiotic, and, but uh, of, of, of course... Anybody who is, a, who is a Bush follower can't be all that intelligent. Oh, then, well, 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 but, Mark, we've got to take a break. So Mark, you had one last point you wanted to make? Yes, uh, the famous uh, peace to strength, you know, one-liner worth a dime by, you know, the, by our famous President Ronald Reagan. If you examine it, it's nothing but wrong. It's untrue. It's silly. Uh, the strongest countries in the world have been the most unpeaceful. Uh, you know, they've been the most aggressive. Uh, Ronald Reagan himself, you know, was not known for... You know, for his uh, uh, meekness and in, uh, in, uh, in, in being peaceful, uh, he invaded Grenada. He invaded Lebanon, if you, as you may recall. He fought his proxy wars in Central America, in which tens of thousands of people got slaughtered on, on both sides. Uh, and, uh, and and what about Adolf Hitler? He was very strong, and yet Germany was not uh, was not all that uh, peaceful. That's but, a very good. That's a very good point. But and then you take the countries like Switzerland, that is not all that strong. Or Sweden, that is not all that strong. Or Uruguay, who's not strong at all. Well, Switzerland and, has the best navy in the world, as we all know. And uh, and they seem to uh, to enjoy uh, far more peace. I think it should be uh, if he, if you have said something like peace through morality in respecting your uh, your neighbor's uh, liberty, life, and property, I think that that probably would have been far truer than peace through military strength. 
peace through minding your own business. Absolutely. Yeah, very, very good. As we've said before, it's perpetual war for perpetual peace. All we got to do is to wipe out this bunch of bad guys, and then we will bring peace to the world from now till eternity. And, of course, it never happens, so it is a perpetual war for perpetual peace. And this country has not really been at peace in over 60 years, despite all the strength, despite being the world's only superpower. And one of the points that uh, Richard makes in this latest issue of his, I mentioned earlier that he has a long section on the history of the British Empire. At one time, the British Empire was the superpower that the United States is today, and they had uh, imposed their way by force all over the world. And what they did was to create an enormous amount of resentments around the world, and by our associating with them, we are associating with the British peace through strength, which was brutality in India, brutality in Ireland, brutality in South Africa, brutality in Australia, and a lot of other places. And so we, to a certain extent, by associating with the British, are paying a price for all that the British have done, and then everything that we do through strength is creating our own series of resentments from people, from the Iranians, the the Grenadians, the Nicaraguans, and the others, and so we're paying the price for all of these, and the only possible way is to mind our own business. Thank I, you very much sure. for calling, have Mark. A, have a good night. Let us go now to Karen in New Orleans. Good evening, Karen. Yes, good evening. Um, I would like to talk on one of the uh, persons that you had on your program. They were speaking on the Middle East, and I think he was saying that the fact that Israel was formed, the country was formed, uh, it was... The way it was formed wasn't, you know, established that it wasn't right. Mm -hmm. and yeah, so, actually, I was the one who said that. Really? Yeah, so go ahead. Uh, it was created by force. They, they just carved out an area in the Middle East and said, all right, this is going to be Israel. They didn't ask the people who were living there if they wanted it to be Israel. They just said, we owe the Israelis something, so we're going to give them this nation just the way after the, it was after the Second World War. And in the same way, they redrew the map of Europe and gave parts of Poland to Russia and, and parts of uh, Germany to Poland and, and uh, Yugoslavia. And it just goes on and on and on. And when you don't uh, ask the people there if they want to go along with this, then what do you expect them to think about it? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I interrupted you. Go ahead with what you want to say. That's okay. I, um, well, um, I happen to like kind of disagree with you because, um, of course, biblically speaking, I do believe that Israel belongs where it is, and that uh, it was established and it should be where it is, and that um, that uh, the greatest thing to happen in this country was to have Israel as a friend. I Why think, is that? Because I think they've always been independent, and they have a democracy there. They've tried to have a democracy. Now they're going in having problems with the Palestinians. It's kind of hard to keep democracy there when you're being blown up every five, ten minutes, but. It's the only country over there, really, that's had a democracy, and, and, and they're having problems with the Palestinians, yes, but I think eventually when they work out their problems and the Palestinians can come to the table, when they can get rid of Arafat, who is a known terrorist, and get somebody in there who's trying to sit at the table and negotiate with the Israelis and trying to make peace, that they can come to a, to a decision that, that they have to live together, and that... Uh, they either live together, they destroy each other. And I think uh, Israel has always tried to be friends with its neighbors. It's just that the Palestinians want it on their terms. That's well, my opinion. I, I understand what you're saying. You realize, of course, that Israel was born in terrorism. Menachem Begin, who eventually became the prime minister of Israel, was involved with the terrorist gang that blew up a hotel in Jerusalem and was involved in many other acts trying to get the British to turn over Palestine to them, and of course during these 50 years that they've been at war with the Palestinians, they have also killed a lot of innocent people, the Israelis have, in Lebanon and other places, and I don't see why the United States should take sides in a battle between two people, neither of which has anything to do with the United States of America. You say they have been our friends there, but you, what you mean is they have supported us when we have gone to war against Iraq, they have supported us in the United Nations when we have tried to impose our way in other countries, and that's not what the United States is supposed to be about. The United States is supposed to be about liberty and peace, not going around the world telling everybody how to live. So the fact that somebody is willing to support us, whether it's Britain or Israel or Australia or somebody else, I don't see that that's something that we ought to change the United States in order to achieve. Am I making any sense at all? Well, I guess you have your point of view and I have mine, but I think after the Holocaust, uh, we kind of needed a place to go and call home because nobody wanted them. Everybody kicked them out. And um, yeah, even the United I, States kicked them out. Yeah, good point. So um, they needed a homeland. And they fought, yes, yeah, sure, they fought in that homeland and, and blood, and even the British were trying to keep them out of that place, Palestine, which finally, through many wars, they uh, fought and formed their little land there. It wasn't easy. Thank you very much, though, Karen, for calling in. And the point I wanted to make was that if the United States had spent on Israel at the outset the money that would have been necessary to buy property to form a nation as large as Israel, perhaps from people in Brazil or people somewhere else in the world, then 
they would not have had to spend all of this money over the last 50 years trying to bring peace to the Middle East. It isn't just all the foreign aid. It isn't all the military uh, supplies that have been given to Israel. Our government has given money to Egypt, has given money to Lebanon, has given money to Syria, has given money to Jordan, to all these different countries to bribe them to come to the peace table and try to make peace with Israel. There has been tens of billions of dollars, easily a hundred billion or more, spent because of Israel being there in the Middle East. The United States, for $10 billion at the most in 1948, could have bought property for the Jews to settle somewhere else in the world rather than just simply stealing property from other people. And one last point is that we have been told many times by supporters of Israel, well, the Palestinians got their own nation, and it was Jordan, but the Jordanians don't want them. Well, that would be like saying somebody's going to come in and take your home, but we're going to give you a plot of land in Wyoming. Well, maybe you don't want to live in Wyoming. Maybe you want to live where you were born and grew up and not be forced to give up the property that you have and move out of that area. So a couple of emails here. I got a nice one from Chris who says, I listen to your show on the Internet from the United Kingdom, better known as England and the British Isles, and I wish to commend you for spreading the libertarian message. My question is, do you feel a libertarian government should retain control of the money supply? No, absolutely, no, absolutely not. It wasn't in the Constitution that there should be a national bank or that the government should issue any money at all. Congress has the power only to define what the dollar is in terms of gold. And that's like saying we define one foot as being 12 inches. And they defined a dollar as being approximately 121st of an ounce of gold. The money was actually issued by private banks, and the system was far more stable than it is today. We hear about wildcat banking, about uh, banks failing and leaving people holding the bag and so forth. But it all assumes that people were so stupid in the 19th century that they would just willy-nilly deal with a bank that did not have a reputation and could not demonstrate its stability. Actually, the banks were relatively stable, far more than they have been in the 20th century with the Federal Reserve System. And we could go into that in greater length at another time. Chris also asked, why doesn't the Libertarian Party in the U.S. advocate a proportional representation system for a congressional election since it would provide a greater chance of a third party getting representation. Well, a lot of libertarians have proposed that. I think the reason more of them don't is simply because it seems so unattainable, unlike certain attainable objectives like electing a libertarian president in 2004 or, well, you get the point. Martin in Phoenix asks, will you endorse a candidate for the libertarian presidential nomination? If so, when? I may do so, but it wouldn't be before the first of the year. I'd like to see who else gets in the race, and I'd like to see how those in the race conduct their campaigns before I throw my weight, my, my appreciable weight, my 225 pounds, behind whoever I think would be the best candidate. Bob out there in cyberspace says, are you aware of any private schools in the country that are decidedly libertarian? I'm not familiar offhand with any private elementary or high schools, although I know that there are some. I am aware of Hillsdale College in Michigan, which is an excellent college that takes absolutely no government aid at all and may be now the only one in the country that can say that. They not only will not take government aid directly, they will not admit any student who is receiving government aid in the form of a Pell Grant, student loan from the government or GI Bill or any of that sort of thing. They will help students get private fi financing if they need it, but they will not get themselves involved with the government in any way whatsoever. I made the mistake this past week of watching part of the California recall election debate and I have to say that Arnold Schwarzenegger did not sound like a big government Republican. Actually, he sounded more like a big government Democrat. He was talking about children all the time. Everything's for the children. Talking about children in California needing to have government health insurance, uh, children in California needing more money for education, tens of billions of dollars for infrastructure to bring business back to the state of California. And why do we have to bring business back to the state of California? Because when business is here, their revenues produce taxes that can be used then for all those programs we want, all those government programs. How wonderful. Well, that's what Arnold Schwarzenegger is offering California. I wrote an article about this, which went out on my Freedom Wire email list late last night and is on my website right now. You can link to it from the homepage, harrybrown.org. And in there, I mentioned that I do not condemn Arnold Schwarzenegger for his views or for wanting to run for president, I mean, uh, or pardon me, for governor. I mean, who wouldn't want to be governor of the most populous state in the union? Well, aside from you and me, perhaps. But the point is that the Republicans are the ones who have made themselves so pathetic by latching onto this guy. Bill Simon said Arnold is just the right man to be governor of California. Peter Uberoff is going to give an endorsement this week. He was uh, another major candidate who dropped out. Most likely, he'll endorse Schwarzenegger. The Republicans nationally and locally in California are falling all over him and supporting him. Sean Hannity, people like that are also supporting him. And they show themselves to be with only one principle, and that is just see to it that Republicans win elections any way possible. As far as principles about government or about the size of government or about personal freedom or liberty or any of these things, forget it. 
you can read that article. It's called The Pathetic State of Politics, as I say, by going to my website. I got an email from someone, and not a listener to this broadcast, I take it, but who read the article, and he said, please speak up on behalf of libertarians rather than sniping at the current administration. It's not the greatest, I agree, and I, I made some remarks about Bush in there also. And he said, but way in the hell better than democratic socialists who are bent on nothing else than ruling the people under their thumb. Please support anyone who moves us away from these terrible forms of control. And he gave me some examples in his email. Please support anyone who moves away from these terrible forms of control, even if they don't travel as far as you would want them to. That can come later one step at a time. Mister, i got to tell you, you are under the false impression that they are moving in the direction we want only too slowly. No, they are moving in the opposite direction from what we want, and they're moving too quickly. Government increases just as fast under Republicans at the state level or national level as it does under Democrats, and in some cases faster because there is no opposition. Democrats aren't going to impose big government. They just want to manage it themselves, but they will still continue to support more money for the government schools, more money for government health care, more money for anything that will make government bigger. But at least when you have a Democratic president, some Republicans will fight back and try to stop some of the programs. My point is that they are imposing upon, upon you the biggest scam in the world. And that scam is, gee, if we don't elect this Republican, no matter how many disagreements we may have with what he's doing, we're going to get something far worse. No, we don't get something far worse. The Democrats are pulling the same scam on liberals by telling them that they got to support some idiot, like this General Wesley Clark that's running now, who's done enough flip-flops already to qualify for the Olympic gymnastic team. Don't pay attention to them. Be your own man. Vote libertarian or don't vote at all. At least then you can look yourself in the mirror. This is Harry Brown. I'm so glad you joined me tonight. Be here next week and we'll do it again. Have a good week and good night.